afternoon and good day. Um, so nice to have you again uh, on the Saturday and today. Um, our speaker will be uh, Dr. Luis Serpel, and I'll pass it to um, uh, Dr. Radford to introduce um, uh, our speaker. Thank you so much for both of you joining us this, uh, this day. Thanks, Magda. It's a real great pleasure to be here for this uh, seminar this afternoon. And I'm particularly delighted to introduce my long-term friend and colleague, Professor Louise Serple, as one of today's speakers in this really great seminar series that brought us all together over the last more than year. So as I'm sure you'll all know, Louise is Professor of Biochemistry at the University of Sussex here in the UK. And she's also a director of Sussex Neuroscience, as you can see at the top of her slide. So Louise's work focuses on the mechanisms of protein self-assembly into amyloid. And this leads to the neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's, that she's going to tell us about today. So um, Louise um, started her career in the amyloid field in the very early days when I first met Louise, when I was given the auspicious privilege of being her mentor when she joined the University of Oxford to under, uh, undertake her DPhil studies at Lineker College. And she also worked there with Colin Blake, a real early pioneer in the amyloid field when it didn't have the scientific popularity that it has today. And there, working with Colin Blake and Margie Sunday, some of you may know, Louise and the team use fiber diffraction to analyze the cross beta structure of amyloid fibrils from different patient samples, giving us those early views of the uh, polymorphism of amyloid fibrils from a whole variety of diseases. And following that, Louise really went on to pioneer the use of X-ray diffraction to understand the structure, the cross, what we really mean by the structure, the cross beta structure of amyloid in atomic details. And Louise provided some of the first all atomic models, in fact, of the cross beta structure of amyloid in peptides using uh, fiber diffraction methods. So uh, following her defil in Oxford, Louise uh, undertook a postdoc in Toronto for two years, and then she moved back to the UK where she held a very prestigious MRC Career Development Fellowship, where she started to establish her independent career in Cambridge, again using electron microscopy as well as fiber diffraction to look at amyloid fibers. And she established her independent group in Sussex 18 years ago, and has been promoted all the way through now up to full professor there. So um, Louise, um, it's a real privilege and an honor to um, host you today. And you're going to give us a seminar on proteins at the center of Alzheimer's disease. We're looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Sheena. That was really lovely and such a nice surprise, surprise to see you today. Um, really nice introduction. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to thank Rams and the rest of the team who um, invited me to give this talk today. So I have to admit at the beginning that I've been slightly chaotic this morning and I may have too many slides. So what I'm going to try and do is to um, go through, make sure that the story makes sense, but I may uh, speed through a couple of the slides. And if of course anyone's got any questions about anything that I had to go past too quickly, then I'm very happy to answer any questions um, towards the end of the whole session. So what I wanted to talk about today is the proteins at the centre of Alzheimer's disease. And I know that this audience um, doesn't need a huge amount of introduction. So those are some of the slides I will skip through. Um, but just to mention that in the background here is an electron micrograph showing paired helical filaments um, formed from the protein um, tau, a fragment of tau. And I'm going to say a bit more about those um, towards the second half of the talk. So, um, as I'm sure you're all aware, um, our pathogenic amyloid fibrils are what I think of as uncontrolled assembly. And the main thing that I wanted to mention here was um, really going back to amyloidosis as a disease, which, as Sheena very kindly explained, uh, that was where I sort of started my whole um, career, was looking at transthyroid in amyloid, in fact. Um, and what we notice in these two slides here is that on the left hand side we've got a normal heart tissue and on the right hand side what we've got is a patient who's got heart failure 
due to the deposition of light chain amyloid in the heart muscle. And although in Alzheimer's disease, which is what I'm going to focus on today, there's many um, discussions about the importance of oligomeric species. What we can see here, I think very nicely illustrated is how important those amyloid fibrils are themselves in terms of disruption of tissue and how important that is when we think about um, some of these um, other systemic amyloidoses. So as Sheena nicely said, um, I um, started off my career looking at the structure of amyloid. Um, and so this is a relatively brief slide uh, that harks back to the X-ray fibre diffraction um, information that we uh, worked pretty hard um, to generate. Um, and some time ago, we had a look at this um, peptide, a short peptide from the middle of amyloid beta, 11 to 25, which self-assembles into these incredibly ordered um, fibrils. Um, and by cryo-electron microscopy, we were able to um, actually collect data that showed the cross beta structure, whereby these um, beta strands run perpendicular to the fiber axis. And this is a, a really lovely, very early 2000 um, micrograph, which in which you can actually see the, the beta structure. Um, so incredibly unusual and says a lot about this particular sample, I think. But before that, we were interested in um, examining the structure of amyloid fibrils using X-ray fiber diffraction. And what we tended to do was to collect diffraction patterns from bundles of amyloid fibrils, and they almost always looked like this. Um, this is a cross beta diffraction pattern with a beta strand um, spacing of 4.76 uh, that should say angstroms, it's got disappeared, uh, on the meridian of the x-ray pattern and um, a 10 or 11 angstrom reflection coming up on the equator. Um, and this one will vary, the 10 or 11 angstrom reflection, because it comes from the distance between the beta sheets. So I'm going to go back to this um, pattern in a minute as we're looking at this movie which was built uh, by a PhD and then postdoc in my lab, Kyle Norris. And this is really a generic amyloid uh, model that was built um, from x-ray data and we actually used a short amyloidogenic peptide to generate this. Um, so as I, sh I show the movie, um, hopefully um, I can reiterate exactly what cross beta means. So here what you can see in blue is the beta strands running perpendicular to the fibre axis and here you see that massive network of hydrogen bonds that um, link all of this together. Here, this that distance was 4.6 angstroms, and now we're looking down the fiber axis, so looking down the sheets, and you can see interdigitation of the side chains, and this distance is around 10 angstroms, but will differ depending on what those side chains are. So although the self-assembly of amyloidogenic proteins is a uh, essentially based on hydrogen bonding between the molecules. Of course, the sequence of these proteins is also very important in terms of the essentially sandwiching together of these, um, these beta sheets within the protofilament. Um, so I'm gonna skip on to the next slide here. And actually that really is uh, pretty much all I'm gonna be saying about cross beta today. What I want to do really is sort of update you on the sorts of things that my lab are doing um, in more recent years. And we've really been focused on amyloid beta and tau. So really looking at Alzheimer's disease. And what I'm showing you here is an electron micrograph of um, a tissue section taken from the brain of a patient with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and this image was taken by a postdoc in my lab, Yusra Al-Halili, um, who does lots of immunogold labeling. And so you can probably see these little black dots in here that are coming from the um, immunogold labeling using an antibody against a beta. And what I think you can appreciate here is in this brain tissue, there is a huge accumulation of amyloid fibrils. Uh, sometimes you can even see that they're sort of laterally associated and quite ordered in the tissue. So I think we should be reminded that this is what is actually happening in Alzheimer's disease, as well as, of course, considering the toxic species, the oligomers. So if we zoom in a little bit more, you can see that huge deposition of amyloid fibrils. So we know that these are made of A-beta because of the, the antibody. So it's been very well um, 
discussed in the field in the last sort of 10 to 15 years that um, amyloid beta can be neurotoxic. And if I just simplify this right down to going from monomer to aggregate to oligomer to protofibril to amyloid fibril and then amyloid plaque, what we were interested in doing was trying to understand something about how some of these species, whether it's a mixture or um, a continuum or an individual species, might actually be interacting with neuronal cells and causing um, the dysfunction and cell death that we see in Alzheimer's disease. And so again, this is a very simplified um, slide showing a neuron, uh, just pointing out where the damage might be happening. So of course we've got the plasma membrane and then we've got mitochondrion lysosomes, obviously nucleus here, and the synapse connections, which are obviously reasonably uh, specific to neurons and also the transport of cargo along the axon. And what of course is very important is that each one of these organelles is surrounded by membrane and there's been lots of um, studies that suggest that amyloid beta oligomers are able to interact with and um, disrupt lipid membranes. So that might be really important in um, these mechanisms. But what I want to talk to you about today is some of the work that we've been doing to try and isolate exactly which, which one of these species or whether it's a continuum of these um, is actually toxic and potentially how. So first of all, just to explain what we do, we use um, cytotoxicity assay, which is a live dead um, cell assay. So we don't use LDH or MTT or, or those, um, those sort of metabolic um, processes. What we do is we've got uh, hippocampal neurons growing here in a um, dish. Um, we use um, the live dead assay from in vitrogen that allows us to look at the live cells. Um, and in this image, you can see already just from the DIC that these cells are looking pretty disrupted and dead, um, and the dead cells are um, shown in green. And so that allows us to look at um, the cell death. But before I go on to what is happening with amyloid beta, unfortunately this slide may be a little bit small in your images, but hopefully I can go through this quite um, reasonably. We realized that what we needed to do before we went on to look at toxicity was we needed an A-beta control. And some of my colleagues in neuroscience would always ask me, well, A-beta may be toxic, but what is your control? And we didn't feel that the um, current controls for A-beta uh, were suitable. And I'll show you a little bit more data on that in a couple of slides. Um, and so we designed our own. And so what we did was we introduced two um, amino acid differences at glycine 37 and phenylalanine 19, um, which in the Waltz algorithm, which allows you to predict um, amyloidogenesis um, from a sequence, um, it basically uh, removes that amyloidogenesis from this um, algorithm prediction. And then we went on to look at this peptide once we'd made it. Um, it does not assemble over seven days. It shows no increase in thioflavin T fluorescence over seven days. It remains completely random coil over seven days. And even uh, on a gel, it remains completely monomeric. Um, and if I compare that to um, A beta, um, I'm sure that many of you would know that um, this would show fibrils, this one would show um, an increase in thioflavin T, this would show some beta sheet, the CD would, and you would see um, a, a, a smear here of all of the um, large um, insoluble species um, formed from amyloid beta. And then we went on to look at the toxicity of these species. So in a live dead assay, we found that the um, variant A beta was not toxic. So it has no effect on the cells um, over time. And uh, this is an unusual model, which uh, always gets, gets a few questions. We worked with um, a colleague called George Kemenesh, who works on these um, water snails. Um, and they've been doing this for many, many years, looking at memory and learning in these animals as a model system. And so what we did with um, Lindsay Ford, who was a student at the time, was injected um, oligomeric A beta 1 to 42 into these snails and then tested their memory. And it might sound a bit silly, but actually it's a really robust model. And what we can see is that when we do that, our, the memory of the snail is reduced when it's wild type A beta. But when we do that with the variant, it's really no different from just vehicle buffer. So we know um, then that this is a pretty good control, this 
uh, control remains what appears to be monomeric and it also is not toxic um, in our cellular assays. So then we wanted to ask what actually makes A beta toxic? And we thought we could use our variant um, to help us answer that question, but also to um, use, oops, sorry, uh, to use some of the other um, what, what have been called models um, controls out there to look at this in a bit more detail. So here's amyloid beta wild type after four hours and it forms these oligomeric species and you start to get beta sheet over time as you would expect. Uh, so we've got these clear, very clear fibrils um, after 72 hours, really nice uh, beta sheet structure formed. Our variant, as I've already shown you, doesn't form fibrils at all, it remains random coil. But if we take a beta reverse or a beta 42 scrambled, both of which are on the market as controls, we actually see that very quickly these can self assembly, assemble rather. That I, I couldn't claim that these look like beautiful amyloid fibrils, but I can tell you that both of them give us a um, cross beta diffraction pattern. They're not highly ordered, but they are aggregates for certain, and they do contain quite a bit of beta sheet. So while the reverse um, peptide takes some time to become fully beta sheet, the scrambled is actually pretty much beta sheet is even from the onset. So this gives us a sort of useful um, set of tools to look at what is actually toxic. We've got oligomers of wild type and fibrils. We've got variant A beta that doesn't form fibrils at all. And then we've got these two um, controls, known as controls, um, to look at toxicity as well. And what we find is that only a beta 1 to 42 appears to be exist as an oligomer for any length of time. So we know the variant a beta 42 doesn't form oligomers at all, it doesn't assemble. Um, a beta 42 to 1, the reverse, uh, goes pretty quickly into what we would probably call protofibrils. Um, the scrambled again goes into what seem to be more fibrillar structures um, and um, a beta 42 wild type forms these oligomers that do seem to be around for enough time for us to sort of observe them um, as they form. So we think this is pretty important in terms of what's actually going on in the toxic uh, mechanism. Um, so could it be the size and the confirmation of um, amyloid beta. So what um, a student of mine, Devki Radical, did was to look at this in a bit more detail and she'd done a lot of the work on variants as well. Um, so here's our oligomeric A beta. Um, it's not very discrete um, oligomeric species, but it's, it's little round things under the electron microscope. Then she also formed from some fibrils and then she took those fibrils, she sonicated them to try and get as much oligomeric um, material as possible, so at least to reduce the size of these structures. And what you can see from the CD is that the um, a beta oligomer is mostly random coil with maybe a little bit of beta sheet in it. The fibrilla, as you would expect, is very beta, and so is the sonicated. So as we've sonicated these into smaller fragments, I suppose, they haven't actually lost that beta sheet structure. And what we found when we looked at this toxic assay on, neuro, um, on hippocampal neurons was that um, only the oligomeric species um, was toxic. So here we've also looked at the, um, the um, toxicity of um, wild type A beta, the reverse, the scrambled and the variant. And what you'll notice again is that only A beta is toxic. None of the others seem to have any um, obvious toxicity here, similar, I would say, to the buffer. So oligomeric A beta and only A beta, not the other um, peptides. So that begs the question, what is it about um, A beta wild type that makes it toxic to cells while um, even the self-assembling um, controls, the reverse and the scrambled, are not toxic at all. And so what Devki went on to look at was um, the internalization of A-beta, and this is skipping um, quite a lot of work, probably a year's worth, where she showed that only the oligomeric A-beta appeared to be internalized in any um, large amount of way, um, large uh, extensive manner into the cells, whereas the fibrilla and even the sonicated, even though it's small, um, are not so much um, internalized. You could say that this sonicated is sort of in intermediate between the fibrilla and the oligomeric. 
Um, and then she was interested to see what would happen if we introduce oligomeric A beta and then um, we wash it away after either two hours, four hours or 24 hours or not washed at all and incubate for seven days and then do our toxicity assay. And the reason for doing this was really to see if how long it takes for enough oligomeric A beta to go into the cells and cause toxicity. And what this uh, graph then shows is that if you leave it for seven days and you don't wash it off at all, it's maximally toxic. But if you leave it for two hours and then you wash it away, then there's not enough A beta has gone inside the cells. And the same is true at four hours. It's not until A beta has been uh, with the cells for 24 hours that it allows enough in to cause a uh, significant cell death. Um, so now we wanted to say, so at this point, what we know is that um, oligomeric A beta is toxic, which you might say, well, we knew that anyway. Um, so really now we want to see, is it a specific oligomer that's responsible for toxicity? And this little part of the talk is really um, sort of um, an accident in a way, if, if you can... Um, if you can understand what I mean. So essentially we had been looking at dityrosine formation. So A beta can form dityrosine in, the, um, in an environment in which there is oxidative um, stress. So it forms a cross-linked um, species here. Um, and we can see those if we use an um, immunogold antibody against, um, against dityrosine. So we can see that there are cross-links formed in these fibrils. Um, we can also see dityrosine um, cross-links in um, amyloid plaques in vivo. So we know that this might be an important, um, play an important role in um, pathology. So we thought, well, let's see if we can make some of these dityrosine uh, cross-linked oligomers and see how toxic they are. So this work was all done by Mahmoud Mena, um, and he first of all showed that you can um, oxidize the A beta and cause it to form um, dityrosine using um, UV exposure for two hours. And so what you can see here is dityrosine fluorescence intensity, which increases over two hours. Um, and what we notice is that the variant A beta um, it can also form um, dityrosine. So we get the wild type A beta and the variant A beta both forming dityrosine. But what's interesting here is that if we look at um, this over time, um, they're very much the same. And then if we look at um, thioflavin T intensity, only the A beta, which has not been exposed to UV light, actually appears to self-assembly. We get a little bit of assembly, and as we'd expect, no assembly from variant A beta or when it's been exposed to UV light. So it suggests here that the dityrosine formation is not certainly enhancing um, self-assembly. If anything, it's actually preventing it. So that's not quite what we expected to happen. Um, a and also it seems to halt any um, formation of beta sheets. So essentially what we think is that the oxidation at the level we're using it um, is um, inducing the formation of dietyrosines, which essentially halt and um, cross-link um, the species in the sample. And this is illustrated um, here that we get these sort of bundles of um, what look like amorphous aggregates here. So these are oligomeric species about the right size for oligomeric species. Um, and also um, they show the um, ex expected um, um, intensity on a dot plot if we use this antibody as the A beta oligomeric um, specific antibody new one. So um, these preformed fibrils, if we do that, is they won't elongate any further. So essentially what this is doing is whatever point at which we uh, exposed A beta to um, UV light, then it will um, cause there to be formation of crosslinks and it will freeze our species at that point. So this means that now we've got potentially we've got some oligomeric species that are frozen in that state and we can add them to cells and see if they're toxic. And we might predict that if we've made toxic oligomers, then of course we would expect them to be toxic. And what we actually see is not quite that at all. In fact, what we do see is that um, the A beta that has not been exposed to UV light um, is toxic, as we would expect. And um, 
the A beta that has formed cross links is not toxic at all, and neither is the variant, whether or not it's got some UV light in it. So this suggests to us and made us uh, come up with the hypothesis that A beta um, toxicity is actually reliant on self-assembly. So it may be that the oligomer needs to continue to self-assemble um, in order for its toxic mechanism to occur. So it might not be that there's a single oligomeric species that's responsible for these mechanisms. And so we went on to have a look at these oligomers in a bit more detail and see exactly what they might be doing. So these are not oligomers that have been dietyrosine cross-linked, they're just ordinary A-beta oligomers. And we wanted to look at their the um, internalization and where they go when they're internalized into cells. Um, and we're following the lysosomal pathway in neurons. And in order to do that, we developed um, the tagging with a cipher dye, which is a pH sensitive dye, which will fluoresce in acidic compartments. So as um, a protein is internalized via the endosomes to the late endosome and then to the lysosome, then the pH drops um, significantly and we get more and more fluorescence. So in these two little movies, I'll show you internalization. So first of all, this is just ordinary old Alexa fluor 488. So it's green. And what you see, first of all, is the A beta is being internalized. You see it more and more. Um, around the nucleus uh, within these um, neurons. So these are hippocampal neurons. If we look at the pH sensitive dye, uh, which this time is red, you see uh, more of a step as it goes into the cells and then it gets in, um, it becomes more and more fluorescence as it goes into those acidic compartments. And all of this work was done by Karen Marshall. So you can see that going into the cells and becoming very bright. And what um, Karen showed also was that um, A beta 48A overlaps really nicely with lysotracker. So we know that the A beta is going to lysosomes. And we've also got some immunogold labeling um, data that shows um, the A beta within lysosomes in cells as well. So first of all, we showed that the oligomeric A beta 42 is internalized, but the variant isn't. Um, and I'll skip through that quite quickly, but hopefully you can see here as you you can see the increase in fluorescence as it goes through into the acidic compartments, whereas this in blue is the variant, so it's not being internalized. And then... Um, please, please. Um, Andy Aberdeen has problems with her internet, so we think that she won't be speaking after you. So just to let you know, you can relax time-wise. Okay, I'll still try not to go massively yeah, over time. You, know um, you don't need to be pressurized for the time, so you can okay. relax. All right, thank you very much, Gina. Um, her unfortunate situation is my gain, I guess. Um, so um, what we wanted to see then was what does this A-beta actually do um, in cells? What effect might it have on, on the normal function of a cell? And in order to do that, we took um, a leaf from Sheena's... Um, my daughter is phoning me. She should know that I'm busy. Um, a beta um, prevents endocytosis of um, ovalbumin. So, so essentially, we used um, some. Um, uh, we followed a protocol that had been developed by um, Sheena's lab, um, although we're using a cipher tag here, um, to look at what happens to ovalbumin internalization. So ovalbumin is a nice model system for, for endocytosis, and we can see that in this little movie here. You can see it being internalized, as you would expect, into lysosomes. And what we did was, first of all, we pre-treated with a beta or with buffer, and then we looked at what happens to the internalization of the ovalbumin. And what we see is that um, when we've treated with a beta, we get a huge decrease in the amount of ovalbumin that's being internalized into these cells. So the question here is actually, is it um, that that the A beta is disrupting the acidification of these and meaning that this is a reduced amount of fluorescence or is it reducing the endocytosis? And that's still a question that we're investigating uh, now. So to summarize what I talked about with the A beta section, oligomeric A beta is neurotoxic, um, but um, and internalizes and it causes dysfunction in the endolysosomal pathway. Uh, but we think that A beta self assembly itself is very important for the neurotoxic effects. And it seems to make sense that as the 
a beta oligomers go into the um, endolysosomal pathway, that, that if they continue to self-assemble, assemble, then that maybe is what's responsible for disruption of the membranes um, in those locations. So it's a very good job that um, I've got a bit more time because I've only just got to tau um, and I've managed to say way more than I needed to, perhaps about a beta, but I'm going to go through this uh, reasonably quickly too. Um, so this is a, uh, now we're going to switch to tau pathology um, in neurofibrillary tangles. And what you can see again here is immunogold labeling using this time an antibody against tau and showing you the paired helical filaments um, deposited in the brain tissue of a patient. And what we were really lucky to see here was actually, um, this is in situ, the paired helical filament um, uh, quite clearly, I think, um, in the tissue, which of course you wouldn't expect um, normally to be able to see very clearly. And of course, I'm sure you're all very aware of the cryoream structure of paired helical filaments that are isolated from AD brain. So I won't go over that in a lot of detail, but we know now that there's, um, that this, these um, tau, uh, molecules fold into a very specific structure, um, which is an in-register um, parallel structure, whereby each one of the molecules is folded into a single layer, which then stacks up to form this uh, cross-beta structure. What I think is really interesting is that now that there are lots of um, structures that have been solved for tau from different diseases. So this is AD, um, this is from um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, um, from Pick's disease and from uh, cortical basal degeneration. What you can see is there are similarities and differences between the structures that are formed here. And so that's very interesting um, that it seems that the uh, potential for a specific polymorph uh, depends on the disease and also uh, gives rise to a particular disease. Uh, the other thing to notice here though, is that the fragment that forms the filaments, um, tau is, a, is quite a large protein, um, but the fragment that forms the core of these filaments is pretty much always the same. Here, 304 to 380. Three, um, 305 to 379, this one's a little bit different because um, it has a longer section um, at the end terminus. Um, and we had been working for some years on um, a core um, fragment of tau that was identified many, many years ago um, by Claude Wishick, who now um, runs tau at RX Therapeutics. And he'd been working on this molecule that he calls DGE, which is uh, 297 to 391. And we've been working on this for some time. He had shown that if you look at um, brain tissue, um, you can see this fragment is, um, is found deposited in the tissue. And we, we did this using an antibody, which is called 423. Um, and you can see gold labeling um, showing that the end, this is 391, is um, available for binding of this antibody. Um, and what's really nice about this peptide is that it forms um, filaments spontaneously. Um, it does all the things we would expect it to do. So it's, uh, we use thioflavin S fluorescence. Uh, it's beta sheet by um, CD, but only when you spin it. So if you do CD on a, a whole sample, you'll get mostly random coil, which reduces over time, suggesting that that's, uh, random coil is dominating the spectrum. But what Yusra did with this sample was then to spin it, separate out the filaments uh, in the pellet um, from the supernatant. And then she finds that there is a beta sheet signal coming from the, from the filaments. Um, this is cross beta. So you can see the 4.7 angstrom reflection and a reflection on the equator at 9.5 angstroms. And we get some really nice looking um, paired helical filaments or what we thought looked like paired helical filaments. Um, I have taken out a couple of slides here because what we were able to show was that these um, fibrils or filaments are, are formed much more easily uh, under reducing conditions. So um, we did a number of studies looking at um, the addition of a reducing agent and looking at the formation of paired helical filaments. So that can be seen in this paper here. Um, 
Then we wanted to do a study to see if actually 297 to 391 are DGE forms filaments that are actually similar to PHF in brain. And I showed you earlier that we were lucky enough to be able to capture some images of paired helical filaments actually in situ in brain. And here we're using an antibody called T22, which is actually against oligomeric tau, which means that we don't get dense labeling of um, the filaments and means that we can actually see them in a bit more detail. And so a student with us um, did a nice study where she measured um, the repeat distance in these tau molecules and looked at the crossover beat, um, distance and compared it to an improved um, set of conditions for making these paired helical filaments. So that's the one I showed you right at the beginning, these beautiful looking filaments that are formed from DJE. Um, and this is some atomic force microscopy that was done um, in Wei Feng Zhu's lab. And so what we are trying to convince ourselves of is that what we're making here is something that resembles closely enough paired helical filaments um, from um, brain tissue. Of course, the only way that we could convince ourselves completely would be if we had a cryo-EM structure. So this means that we've now got a tool that will allow us to look at um, the toxicity of tau. And the reason I say that we um, now have a tool that can help us with looking at toxicity is because um, everything else that has been done to date um, using um, self-assembled tau has been um, in, has involved um, the use of heparin to help the tau to self-assemble. Um, and because full-length tau does not appear to self-assemble by itself. And so um, removal of heparin from the whole process means that we can just look at what's going on with the tau itself. So having spent a little bit more time um, than I should have done, um, what we found was that aggregated but not soluble DJE is toxic to differentiated SY, SH, SY, 5Y. And just to say that we've used here this neuroblastoma cell line, which is a human one, instead of um, hippocampal neurons. And the reason that we've done that is because I am convinced that we need a human form of uh, we need a human cell that's producing human tau in order to look at this properly. So of course the next step would be to use iPSCs from humans. So I'm not gonna go into the details of this, but essentially what we found was that it's actually the larger species that seem to be toxic, but only the soluble um, PHF core or DGAE internalizes over time. So this study was done by Saskia Pollock, Pollock in the lab. And what she showed, and this is um, really some stills from the movie, that over time, the DGAE soluble species will internalize and actually quite a lot of them accumulate inside these um, neuroblastoma cells. And this little movie will show that in a bit more detail. So again, we've got our DJE has been tagged this time with an Alexa floor tag. Um, and you can see it going into the cells and accumulating within them. And this is a zoom in where you can see just a, oh, it's not gonna work. It's too slow. Okay, so it's, it's accumulating within the cells. Actually, the cell doesn't look too healthy either, but um, we don't see any very obvious cell death. And, not all that surprisingly, it seems that this DJE accumulates and is deposited within um, lysosomal compartments. We also noticed that DGE incubation leads to an increase in what has been thought of as the pathological um, form of tau, which is a phosphorylated tau. Um, and we can also see more insoluble tau in these um, samples. Um, so I'm going through this too quickly, uh, but I wanted to skip to this, which I think is really nice and quite interesting. So we did some sections of the cells that have been treated for um, with this DJE. And what we found was that D the DJE accumulates inside these membrane bound organelles. We don't know what these organelles are at this point, and we need to do more studies on it, but we see the tau is accumulated within um, these membrane organelles bound organelles, um, sometimes um, associated with other things. So we need to look at that in a bit more detail. And the way that we dis, um, distinguish these was by using an antibody, which is against the Alexa floor, uh, rather than tau. Um, so more studies need to be go, um, conducted to look into a bit more detail about what's actually in these organelles. 
And just to finally um, complete this um, story, um, we're working with this, um, this company called Tau RX Therapeutics because they had found a drug that they're using in phase three clinical trials um, for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and this um, arose from early work from Claude Wishick um, showing that when you add this uh, methylene blue derivative to paired helical filaments, then it sort of appears to melt them. And so we've been looking at them in a bit more detail to see exactly what is going on with this drug and how does it work. Um, so just to introduce the drug briefly, um, this is a methylene blue derivative and we call it MT plus um, and it becomes um, reduced to LMT. So it's blue when it's MT plus and it um, is reduced to a clear, completely clear um, solution um, with um, when it's reduced under reducing conditions. And we went on, because we had now got a really nice model, our DJE um, self-assembly, it meant that we could now test our drug against um, self-assembly in this system without the use of heparin. And the reason we did that actually in the first place was because USRA quite quickly found that the heparin um, and the um, MT or LMT um, very quickly gave us some um, spurious results because actually the LMT bound to the heparin um, and gave us a really strange looking CD spectrum. So we had a nice system now because we've got these um, self-assembling um, peptide that we can now add our drug to and we can look at the generation of beta sheet structure, the reduction of um, random coil um, structure and try and understand exactly what's happening. So under reducing conditions, what we see is that the more of the drug we have, so one to 10, um, the, the more it reduces the reduction of random coil, if that makes sense. So here we've got um, a, a high amount of um, LMT um, under the reducing conditions, which then prevents um, the self-assembly and the loss of random coil over time, and similarly um, removes the beta sheet. So this is the orange one. You can see that there's no beta sheet in the pellet here. Um, and under these reducing conditions, we can also run a gel and we show that the, um, the protein remains monomeric and there's nothing in the pellet here as we have an increase in the amount of drug. And if we look at the electron micrographs, we can see that we haven't got any filaments formed, whereas this is the control under reducing conditions. So what we were able to show was that the active ingredient is actually the LMT and not the MT plus because we need it to be under reducing conditions. And in order to be completely sure of this, we used a variant of um, DJE, which is C322A, using um, something that then hasn't got any potential to form a disulfide bond and um, removes any um, problems with that. And without DTT, we see no difference in um, random coil uh, and we still see filaments. And under reducing conditions, we see uh, oligomeric species remaining or at least small species remaining, whereas we don't have any fibrils uh, forming, uh, remaining in our control with high amount of drug. So I'm very sorry that I went through that so quickly. I was feeling very guilty about overrunning so much. Um, so to summarise what I've talked to you about tau today, um, we use this core tau, which overlaps very nicely with the cryo-EM structures. Um, it forms um, paired helical filaments without any heparin or any other additive, and it appears to resemble brain PHFs under reducing conditions. This core tau accumulates in differentiated human neuroblastomas in lysosomes, and, in, and it also leads to in, increased insoluble tau. So what might be happening is this is recruiting endogenous tau and leading to an increase in the amount of um, paired helical filaments within these cells. Um, and we showed that this LMT, which is the drug that's being used in phase th three clinical trials, um, inhibits the self-assembly of this um, DJE. Um, so I want to finish by um, acknowledging um, all the funding that I've been lucky enough to um, 
to be awarded um, and all of the people I hopefully mentioned them along the way I've got a lot of pictures here of very very happy looking people I think in the last year it has been a little bit more of a trial but um, for all of us but um, they're all working incredibly hard still um, despite all of the disruption um, so I've listed um, all of the people that have been involved in this work and I've mentioned um, along the way Claude Wishick um, who runs Tower X Therapeutics with Charlie Harrington and um, John Story um, and all of the other people that we've collaborated with over the years um, and to finish on an on a image of um, where I am actually living at the moment this is Brighton um, and this is the part of the murmuration of the starlings as they settle at um, dusk um, so do come and visit us when it's possible so thank you very much for listening Thank you, Louise. That was a, a real tour de force and a, a joy to listen to, as always. So any listeners, please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A and I'll, I'll read some out to, to Louise. So let's I'm sorry, I was a bit greedy with my time there. It's fine, I think. Andy's uh, problems were to your advantage. I'm sure we'll <laughs> hear Andy on another Saturday afternoon UK time. Okay, so anonymous attendee asks you, Louise, why did you study AB to 42 and not AB to 40? Um, and which one is the most abundant form? So if you could talk about AB to 40, 42 issues mm. and how it change. Yeah, so um, uh, when we first started this work, I think a lot of people had been studying AB to 40 and that was partly because it is um, relatively a little bit easier to work with because it doesn't assemble assemble as quickly um, and generally um, the consensus had been that AB to 42 was more toxic than AB to 40. So in early work we'd looked at lipid um, vesicles and we had looked at both 40 and 42 but I think um, you know with limited resources and limited people and so on at some point you have to decide on one model system to use and of course it is a model system and actually if we're going to get down to it we could say why don't we use for AB to 43 or AB to 46 or AB to 39 and we know that there are lots of different fragments and what people have shown is that um, in uh, in people who are unaffected by Alzheimer's disease um, there's something like a ratio of 9 to 1 40 to 42 and patients who have Alzheimer's disease um, that increases the amount of AB to 42 to um, three to seven. I might have done that the wrong way around, but more AB to 42. So we decided we would focus on AB to 42. And actually, if we were really going to do this properly, I think what we'd want is a real mixture. And I think there's been a lot of work recently looking at those combinations of 40 and 42 and how important they are. So what we have looked at here is uh, the importance of self-assembly um, and the uh, the time perhaps that is spent in an oligomeric form and actually an influence of 40 could help that. So if you have a mixture in there, it slows down the AB to 40 assembly. Uh, sorry, it slows down the AB to 42 assembly. And that okay. could be really important. Sorry, that was a very long answer. It was, we have quite a list of questions. So sorry. Christian Green has two questions for you so he says hi Louise how does the new NU1 or new one antibody compare to A11 for detecting oligomers of A beta? Sheena I, I let Christian in the panel um sorry oh, okay yeah but yeah go ahead Louise he has another question so we'll let him <laughs> okay so um the reason we chose that was because it was specific for A beta basically so it was, it was generated by the Klein lab um, William Klein's lab and so we decided to use that rather than A11 just because it's specific to A beta and so and we've used it a lot and it's worked really nicely for our studies so that's okay. I'm trying to keep it short now Sheena <laughs> there we okay, go thanks. <laughs> thanks I, I continue with the, with the second question um, I think uh, one was the uh, uh, this is shorter version of the tau 297 to 391 it seems that it aggregates without heparin did i understand yeah. that exactly yeah. right yes so we've optimized okay. conditions um, yeah. of assembly and we can and we can actually we can um we can modulate the assembly and make different polymorphs Mm -hmm. by changing the conditions slightly okay okay uh, yeah. i had another question towards a beta and that is um i mean 
Um, it's also discussed that uh, a better oligomers damage mitochondria. And I mean, this this was kind of not in your picture. Is 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 it that you look early, or is it not happening in your in your model? Would you say? I mean, this excludes that there's an effect of a beta oligomers on mitochondria. Uh, no, absolutely. I don't. I'm not. I'm absolutely not excluding it. Um, I think what I think is that a beta is affecting lots of different organelles and we focused on lysosomes here but actually we have done some studies on mitochondria and we're just finding them a bit more difficult to to do we've used a seahorse analysis to to show um some effect of a beta but we're not quite ready with that data so it's yeah i i mean and i we've also done some studies showing that a beta affects synaptic vesicles as well so i think what a beta is doing is lots of things it's not just looking at, it's not just lysosomes that are important i hope that answers your question yes so, thank you so much So Louise, there's a couple of questions about lysosomes and sort of intracellular, extracellular. So an anonymous person asks about what percentage of A-beta is extra versus intracellular. And another question, if I link them from Wolfgang Hoyer, was also said, great talk, nice tools, etc. But you, do you think A-beta and tau, how, do they, how does A-beta and tau meet in AD? And do you think the endos endolysosomal impairment is one way those two peptide proteins could link together in the disease? So I wonder if you could comment on those two. Uh, now, I've immediately forgotten the first question, which was about how much they be, oh no, how much they be external and internal. And, and do, does tau and A beta meet in the endosomal yeah, system? Yeah, so um, of course, um, what we've done here is we've added a protein on the outside of cells to look at what happens inside. And I think A-beta is, an, um, is a secreted protein, so it is found extracellularly. I'm not absolutely certain of the answer to how much of it is inside and how much of it's outside, but clearly it is inside as well as outside. Um, and all of the amyloid fibrils are found on the outside when um, the amyloid beta fibrils. Um, but um, where does A-beta and where do our beta and tau meet? I'm not absolutely sure that they ever necessarily do. And I don't think we have any evidence to support them being there together, but other people may have, we haven't got any. What I think is happening is that um, A beta is creating an environment which then leads to um, tau to aggregate. And whether or not they, they don't need to meet in order for that to happen. So um, the reason I say that is because tau, there are lots of tauopathies. And what I think is happening is that there's an insult um, to the neurons that leads to tau aggregation. And in Alzheimer's disease, that insult is AD, A beta. But in CTE, for example, it's trauma, head trauma. So I think it, or, and in some other diseases, it's a mutation in tau. So I think that A beta is, is causing a, an environmental change, which leads then to the aggregation of tau. But that's, that's my hypothesis. I, I haven't yet been able to, to show it, definitely. But I don't know that they're together, but I wonder if anyone else has, has views that, that they ever see each other. Brilliant. So Lucia Fanchi, do you want to ask your question? Do you have the microphone, Lucia? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, great talk, uh, Louise. Uh, uh, one question you already commented that was uh, about the mixture a beta 40 and a beta 42, because it's indeed the more towards the physiological conditions. So this is already addressed. It <laughs> seems it's a common point. The, the other is regarding uh, the oxidized uh, uh, dietyrosine. Uh, um, compound, let's say, form. And then you say that, that uh, if I understood correctly, that uh, you monitor the presence of this inside the cell with the antibody, specific antibody. Now, I'm wondering if you have checked over time if uh, these uh, uh, bonds, bond the remain remains in the cell or over time with the reducing, possible reducing conditions or reducing agents it would be um, bro uh, broken. So how is the stable this oxidation once is formed? Yeah, okay, thank so, you. 
Yes, that that's a really good question. And it, I mean, I'm, I'm not originally a chemist, so I shouldn't claim um, to know that much about it. But my understanding is that dityrosine is irreversible. So I think that there are some enzymes that can break down dityrosine, but actually what is likely to happen is that once dityrosine has been formed and maybe in the amyloid plaques, it um, stabilizes them. And so we did do some studies looking at A-beta that had formed dityrosine and it is very stable. It doesn't disappear. Um, it may continue to be oxidized, but it doesn't seem to be reversed. So I think, that perhaps the dityrosine is stabilizing those oligomer, um, those amyloid plaques. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Okay, no, thanks. And the tyrosine, there is only one, so in such a way that it cannot form long chains on the dimers. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. And another anonymous one before we take a oral one, Louise, somebody asked you about if you express the tau 297 to 391 in the SHSY cells, does it form fibrils within the cell itself? That is not something we've done at the moment. Um, I know that tau Rx have got the DJE um, expressed in animals so they've got some transgenic animals and I think they do see some pathology but that's not work that I've done so I can't answer that in detail. Brilliant. Dan Raleigh would you like to ask Louise your question? I think Hello, you might be on the phone. Hello Louise. Uh, thanks Sheena. Um, very nice talk Louise. I enjoyed it as always. Um, but a simple question about your nice dityrosine experiment. Um, are any other residues in a beta 1 to 42 O modified under the condition mm. of forming the crosslink? Yeah, so um, it's very likely that um, some are modified and we're in process of trying very desperately to see if we can characterize those. So the other potential culprit is um, methionine oxidation, methionine yeah. um, 35. Um, I think, on, so we've used two conditions, um, copper and hydrogen peroxide or, um, or UV light. Um, and what we're monitoring here is dityrosine because we're using the fluorescence. So we're not at this point monitoring methionine oxidation, but anyone who's got any suggestions about how we can sort of cover the whole peptide and work out what's being modified, I, we'd be very grateful because that's what we're really trying to do at the moment, try and get some good mass spec done of our oxidized peptides and check what else is going on yeah so that's really yeah. cool aspect way ahead for that louise dan does that satisfy you yes thanks very much louise nice. uh bj would you like to ask your question you've got a microphone i think hi louise uh, Hello. very nice talk um and i think you partly answered my question and my question was whether you uh, saw a co-localization of A beta with tau, which you answered. But I do, I do have a question about the uh, idea of extracellular A beta getting internalized directly going into the lysosome. So if it has to degrade the peptide, why does it have to be directly taken up and gone to the lysosome? Why does it even take up the A beta from extracellular space? Um, I think that the others have shown that that um, a beta is secreted and then is re can be re-internalized. Um, so why does it go to the lysosome? It, it does go to the lysosome, but we don't know what happens to it then. And it probably, I think, is remaining in the lysosomes and can't be degraded. So it's self-assembling and remaining in that environment. So potentially that's how it's causing impairment of the whole pathway. Oh, okay. But, but one other follow-up question is that you, you nicely showed this oligomeric A-beta internalizing, but how um, sure are you that they are oligomeric when they get internalized? They, do you have any um, um, you know, data to suggest that they, they, they don't uh, disaggregate or, or even aggregate? Yeah. So um, we have tried as hard as we possibly can to know what we've added. So uh, we can't be sure that once we've added it to the cells that it hasn't changed because of course we've changed the, the conditions that it's in. But what we have tried to do is to optimize as best we possibly can to make a beta, make it oligomeric, know exactly what time point we're gonna add it at and always do exactly the same thing. So you're absolutely right. It goes into the 
um, cell media and it may change, but um, we know what we added. And I think there are lots and lots of studies where that is not the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great. Yeah. Thanks, Louise. So we have another one from anonymous person, Louise. It's going back to your variant A, B, to you started talking about, and they're asking about what happens if you mix A, B to 42 with a variant at different molar ratios? Um, is the variant dominant? You know, which one wins and how much of the variant do you actually need to have to, to prevent aggregation of wild type 42? Yes. So I don't, we have done that and I don't have the data clearly in my head, except for to say that it doesn't do what you think it's going to do. So the idea was to see if the variant A beta would inhibit self-assembly of wild type or that the wild type would enhance the assembly of the variant. And it doesn't seem to do what you expect it to do. And Sheena might be able to explain why, but it's doing something really odd. And we sort of got to the stage where we thought, oh my goodness, we don't know what's going on. So it, yeah, so that would be something I would want to look at again, but it, it reminds me we must look at that again because it's, it's sort of an intriguing situation whereby it doesn't do what you would predict it to do. Sorry. Sounds like a good <laughs> we can meet up, Louise, and have a yes. coffee. Yes. A get yes. Up. We should get Explain that data and what's going on. Yeah. Get out that data and have another look. Uh, Gunilla Westermark, Gunilla, would you like to ask your question? Oh, thank you, Louise. Hello. Thank you, oh, nice to see you. So, so I'm back to the lysosomes because I think it's rather big. You have a lot of interesting data there. So have you done any EM studies to see if you have, in addition to, um, uh, if you have a beta deposits at the additional sites? Um, where, do, where do you mean? Because we're just using... Yeah. So you show that you have um, in the you use the lyso tracker and show that you had a beta in your lysosomes. Yes. Have you looked at these cells on the EM? To see oh yes. Yes, yes, we have. And um, actually, just before um, I started realizing I had too many slides, I took them out. Um, I would say that the majority of what we can see in the immunogold is in lysosomes. Um, we do see sort of. Sometimes we even see fibrils that have seemed to have sort of um, pierced the membrane, um, and but not not anything convincing in mitochondria or anywhere else. See like big um, aggregates that not lysosomal, but uh, and maybe not they don't need to meet the membrane encircled, like just something like a, on a phagos um yeah. Autophagosome. The autophagosome should be membrane and bound and circle. Yes. yes, I um, I think that we focused mostly on lysosomes, but that would be an interesting thing to relook at and just see. It sounds like you've got an idea of something very specific that you're looking for, and we have lots of data because this is one of the projects that we've we've uh, sort of revisited lots of times with students, and we've got loads of images so it would be great if if you're suggesting there's something we should be looking for yeah let's see if you see big big aggregates without any membranes yes yes i'll have a more of this material yeah okay very close to the cell nucleus <laughs> okay what is it we don't really know because we can't identify any membranes at all. There are some, there is a paper from 1998 that talks about acrosomes and so. Acrosomes, okay, great. All right, mm. thank you. We'll have a look at that. And I'll, I'll send you an email if I find something. <laughs> yeah, I'll do that. All right, um, thanks. You. I'm going to take chair's prerogative and ask what I think will be the last question, unless someone, this is your last warning, to type a desperate question in the Q&A. So it was, it was very interesting that your dityrosine seemed to prevent aggregation into fibrils. Given that you've only got one tyrosine, you'd be 10, tyrosine 10 versus tyrosine 10, which I might have thought would have aligned the protein peptide very nicely to form a parallel and register structure. Mm. And then I was 
that's some of Chris Dobson's early work, and maybe others where people have concatenated A beta and you know you can make polymer, you know, two together that make it aggregate even faster. So why does dityrosine prevent the protein from aggregating into a cross beta structure? Well what does that talk about the mechanism? Um I think um so I think that what, what it's doing is um, forming a structure that then is a, not assembly competent. So we've done a similar sort of study with tau, with the DJE, and we see the same sort of thing. Um, and we can get some hints from tau because we can look at the final structure of the cryo EM. And we can see that if you formed tyrosine crosslinks, uh, between two DJE molecules, it would not be amenable to forming the structures you see in the cryo-EM. So I think that maybe what's happening is that we're creating um, a structure that then can't go on to self-assemble. So whether or not, uh, why that is exactly with A-beta, I can't be sure, but we know um, when we try and make dityrosine in tau, uh, we can form it when it's soluble, but not when it's fibrillar. So those tyrosines are not is, in the right place. Is, is dityrosine um, consistent with the cross beta structure then, or is it that the aromatic rings are incompatible with the parallel and register zipper kind of structure? Well, I suppose we don't know exactly where the tyrosine would form. Would it form between the stacks of beta strands or would it form between the sheets? But whatever it's doing, it's forming a peptide that doesn't want to self-assemble. And this wasn't what we expected, to be honest. No, we thought no, that it no. would need self-assembly, which is, and, you know, slightly disappointing, but also gave us some insight into what might be happening. So whether um, oxidation, I mean, what actually is happening in terms of oxidative stress in disease, I would have thought that that would be pathological, but it might be that, you know, the conditions we're using are not really, you know, they're much too... Um, extreme for what might be happening in vivo. Thank you. I think it's really interesting about why it prevents the aggregation. Yeah. There's a bit more questions. I think I'll take these and then probably that's the end. So um, do you think, anonymous person, do you think oligomer formation is driven by a steric zipper of some peptide motif? So it talks a lot about toxic and non-toxic oligomers. So um, what about steric zippers and, you know, you show some beta sheet structure in oligomers and things like that? Um, I, I think that our data and, and lots of other data is pointing towards not a very specific single structure for an oligomer. I'm not sure I'm answering the question correctly. So I think that if you take a preformed fibril and you sonicate it, we don't seem to be making something toxic, I don't think. Um, so what the structure of the oligomer is, I don't know, but is it, maybe it's not that important what it exactly is. Maybe it's the fact that it can assemble that's important and not the structure of it, if that makes sense. I'm not sure that, I, do, I mean, certainly steric zippers exist and that's what the structures are. They're all steric zippers, all of them. Um, but uh, do, I wonder if the question is re referring to the difference between steric zippers and larks. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's anonymous a, attendee, so um, I, mm -hmm. I can't answer. But I was thinking about Chris Dobson and colleagues' work on synuclein showing that it was the more structured oligomers that were toxic. They sort of exposed their more hydrophobic. Yes. Uh, surfaces, whereas if you're just a very non specific globule, you're less likely perhaps to want to interact with a membrane. Yes. Okay, last one, I think, and, and then I'll hand back to uh, Rams or, or Magda. So, uh, Donia, do, do you want to ask, ask Louise your question? Donia Hanafi? Yes, I would like to. Um, thank you for your presentation, I really liked it. Um, I'm still new in the field, but I was interested, did you try to use a mouse model? And if you did, what would be like the behavior that you would study related to the top protein and the memory? Well, uh, I started as a structural biologist and then I became a little bit more of a cell biologist, but I haven't quite got to animals yet. And I'm hoping 
perhaps not to. Um, I do know lots of other people are, are using transgenic animal models. Um, and I think that, um, and the other people might be able to answer this better than me, but I think that um, transgenic tau uh, models have not been well um, characterized at this point. So it's not obvious exactly how tau might be causing, causing neurodegeneration. So the, the place to look is Michelle Godair um, looking at how um, tau might be causing neurodegeneration. So I don't think I can answer it actually, sorry. Thanks, Louise. So uh, Magda, do we keep going with the questions? We've had Louise talking for over an hour or, or what, what, what do we do? Shall I wrap I, things up? I, I see a couple more questions, so I'll let them ask them. Uh, and Bing Zhu has been waiting for a while and Louise, I hope you don't mind. Uh, and then we will wrap it up after that. I don't see any other incoming questions. So All right. that's, that's fine for two me. More then. Thank, thanks, Magda. Two more. So um Bin Zhu, he can he's he's allowed in the in the queue. He's in the queue, right. so he can ask. Bin. Bin. Yeah. Thank you, Sheena, and thank you, Luis, for very nice uh, Hello. Uh, yeah. I have a uh, two uh, technical question. So about your live dead assay in vitro gene base, uh, you, in your early part of your talk, uh, how many cells do you have to count to be accurate, you know, to get accurate results statistically? Uh, this is very different to MTT and uh, the LDH uh, kind of assay. I just yeah. wondering whether you need to count a large number of cells. Uh, so I'll be honest, I've never actually counted any of them myself, but I know that my uh, my students and postdocs have counted a lot, like mm -hmm. really a lot. And what they've also done is to try and um, optimize the the, um, the method by individually counting them. So two of them doing it. And now more recently, we've got um, we've got some algorithms that will count them for you. But it is a really a lot to try and get our statistics to be. Uh, yeah, you know, not to get too much variation. So, I mean, if you need specifics, I can certainly ask one of the poor people who's actually done all of the counting. So, but it's I, very I don't nice. <laughs> the, related to it, uh, I guess is I guess the benefits of it versus uh, the metabolic assays is maybe it could be more, you know, be more powerful in terms of differentiating less toxic amyloid. Uh, so have you tried or in your lab or anyone else try like a tau based toxicity? I know in the field, it's not very toxic in terms of tau or, or ligaments or fibers. We haven't really found it to be very toxic at all, actually. So I, I suspect that tau is, is manifesting its effects in a different way. Um, I, I, I mean, certainly in our studies so far, it doesn't seem to be very toxic at all. Um, the reason that we went to the live dead assay was because there were some problems with MTT and um, the crystals that are formed. And, and all of these sorts of assays get a lot of criticism. And so we wanted to come up with something that was, was based on counting, unfortunately, and you know not based on a colorimetric changes. Um, so, and, and that at least we get reproducible results this way. Yeah, the other very interesting uh, method you use, and you mentioned briefly about snail-based memory test, which I yeah. sounds like a less expensive. And uh, and uh, have you or you know uh, anyone in the field you know try to compare with like a mouse-based, which normally people do for memory test? You know mm -hmm. they are consistent testing when you know the uh, oligomer toxicity or whatever you know cause kind of behavior changes. Because I think uh, maybe your snail based method can be amenable for like a high throughput kind of for drug screening or anything like that. Yes. So, um, so it, it was a collaboration. I'm I'm not the, the snail person myself, and you're right. You only have to feed them with some lettuce, and so they don't need a lot, lot of looking after. And they're all also very simple organisms. So, on the one hand, you could say, oh yes, this is a, a great model, and probably not that you know more. It's not much more sophisticated than a C. elegans, but um, or less sophisticated. I'm not sure, but um, others would argue that it's got it's even further away from being a human being. So it's it's tricky. I think what we were really excited about was that it seemed like all you needed was a beta, and you could cause 
some sort of memory impairment in these animals. And that that, that was sort of an, a really nice finding that you didn't need anything else to be there. All you needed with that was a beta. And so it was a, um, it was a good system to use for that. I don't know whether it's going to take over from mice, but I'm sure that George Kemenes would love that. So yeah, very interesting. Gets, yeah. Okay, the last question I have is about your redox, uh, reducing condition, affecting tau aggregation. Uh, I was wondering whether it's affecting the tau protein, like do you know it has a specific site or cyst uh, cysteine? Or, yeah. it, or, you know, also the inhibitor you mentioned, it does that the, in the condition or redox condition of the inhibitor may also affect, you know, their inhibitory uh, capability affecting the tau aggregation. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so so there's one cysteine at 322 um, in our peptide. And um, it uh, if you take that out, you take out the cysteine and you replace it with alanine, then it assembles much more easily. If you put it under reducing conditions, it assembles much more easily. So it suggests that the cysteine, um, cysteine um, disulfide bond um, is inconsistent with self-assembly. So I think we, what we actually get is two, a mixture of populations um, on um, when we haven't got reducing conditions. Um, and we also noticed that the LMT is better under reducing conditions. So I, we're pretty sure that the LMT is not affecting the cysteine. Um, it's, we don't think it's doing that, um, but um, I'm not sure where I'm going with this now. Um, <laughs> I've probably got a bit too tired, but um, yeah. So, so it's complicated, but there is a cysteine and cysteine does, we don't think it's involved in our peptide. I'm not saying that that's not important in full length town. Very intriguing. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. I'm sorry for keeping you waiting so long. Uh, so the last question goes to a gentleman, Sab Cesar Avila. I'm sorry if I've just mangled your name, but um, we'd love to hear your question. Uh, thank you, Gina. Uh, yes, it's Sab for the Biophysical Society for Argentina. It's, I'm a member of the, of the council. So uh, very nice talk, Luis. Uh, I really enjoy it, uh, especially all, 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 I enjoyed all of it. <laughs> And I was wondering when, when you show the results, I must I might may have missed it. When you show the results about your truncated tau, sorry if I miscall it. Uh, mm -hmm. when you're working with it, have you performed similar work, the same that you have done with A beta, trying to see where is it affecting the cell, whether it is affecting the oxidative stress or the um, or the lysosomes, all, all, all of your aggregates? Yeah, so um, we have done some studies, but we're not as, as far forward um, with that with that as we um, as we are with a beta. So that's ongoing. But we have shown that it goes into the lysosomes, uh, but we haven't shown any impairment. Um, we're currently doing studies on on various effects on synaptic vesicles and lysosomes and so on. So that's ongoing work, and hopefully I'll get to talk about that at the next real life symposium. Let's hope so for everybody. Okay, thank Brilliant. you very much. Thanks. Thanks very much. Well, that brings us to the end. So just personally, and on behalf of all the listeners, just say thank you, Louise. That was a phenomenal seminar as always and uh, terribly enjoyable and really insightful about how AB is happening Thank you. Magda and Rams, I'll hand over thank to you. Thank you very you. much, Louise. Really enjoyed your talk. Um, oh. Yeah. Lovely talk, lovely uh, Q&A session. Thanks, Gina, for uh, making this happen. Thank you very much. I know we are keeping you very late, uh, Luis. Thanks for spending extra time and oh, patiently for me, answering wonderful. a lot of questions. I hope you enjoyed it. Yes, it was wonderful for me. Thank you. And I just, yes, thank you so much, Gina, uh, for spending your Saturday afternoon chairing my talk. I really very much appreciate it. It was lovely. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And thank you yeah. both for for hosting me, um, my Karen. Well, you next week. Yeah, bye -bye. thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. It was a great talk and it's nice seeing you. <laughs> thank you. Oh, uh, let's hope we get to meet in person sometime soon. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.